Hello guys! In the last episode we got to know the king's brother and successor to the throne of Midland. Not only does Julius not like the idea of commoners mingling amongst noblemen, he also fears his status may perish due to Griffith's swift rise. After being <laughs> advised by Minister Foss, he settles for resolving the situation with treacherous means. We'll see about that. <laughs> Hello Corny. Still thinking about Arches pilot, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, not that we have been talking for like one hour before this <laughs> about it. No, no. Honestly, I have to say that I was surprised in a positive way and I have to give credit to them big time yeah. uh, for accomplishing this, uh, this episode. And I mean, like they're a fan studio. So you have to give them extra props yeah. for making such an episode. I mean, they're they are just fans who are dedicated to adapt something in a way others don't have or couldn't. Yeah. And uh, the fact that they did it as fans and not as a full-time studio makes it, makes it all the much better. Yeah, I, I just... Uh, we were just talking about it and I said, okay, I would go work a few days each week to enable them to work full time on it <laughs> so if you're interested in that please contact me no honestly yeah huge credits to them um, I'm still thinking about it and I can't wait to have a little chat with you I need to organize my thoughts a little bit but I think we'll soon be ready to talk about it <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe like replacing a weekly Zodcast episode with a weekly Zodcast episode about talking um, about the Arch Studio and their pilot episode. Yeah, maybe the next one, we'll see. <laughs> like all, all the other uh, YouTubers and like guys who are active in the Brazil community already <laughs> gave out their thoughts and we're just, all right, <laughs> we will do it in a, in one to two weeks. Uh, we'll, we'll take <laughs> our time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like one post five minutes after won't suffice. We need one to two hours at least to talk about it <laughs> yeah no yeah yeah definitely yeah. we have to we have to give all of our thoughts about that yeah. i mean they yeah as i said they accomplished uh, real big things there yeah. especially the animation yeah. and um and the action so i think it's not unreasonable to i don't know compliment them about their about their achievement so to say absolutely not for um i still have the 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 cursed guts theme echoing in my mind the reversed one at the end is this is so amazing i absolutely <coughs> want it on spotify honestly i love this one <laughs> i still i still have uh the voice lines of of tosca <laughs> in my in my in my head echoing yeah, yeah. how we how he said with his deep voice uh, how we talked about the sword, the, <laughs> yeah. the sword and the and the big heap of iron it is yeah and yeah like the the best best voice actor ever not like his, his voice <laughs> is just it's just insane not gonna lie we're like the biggest tosca fan club over here honestly but <laughs> <laughs> we're probably mentioning uh, him every episode <laughs> yeah maybe maybe like you you put it in again the, i will uh, like this I like this question because I, funny enough, have educated myself. I, I already will have done it. <laughs> uh, okay. Just, just superior. Yeah, it is great. Oh. oh, I'm so much looking forward to it. I have to refrain from talking about it further, so I, I, I won't be able to stop myself. <laughs> All right, I'm. A, I'm. A have to stop you. I see there. So maybe, maybe instead of uh, rambling about the about the Arch Studio pilot. Maybe let's get into our weekly Berserk fact because I I think someone sent something to you that you want to talk about right now. Yes, 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 yes. Um, it's kind of a mixture between... Maybe let's do the, the mention and then the weekly Berserk fact, but we can might as well just call both of it weekly Berserk fact because there was one of our listeners who sent us a beautiful gift. Um, he is called Weenus2 on Instagram. He is a Berserk trading card and sales collector. And there are many treasures in his collection. I personally like the collection of Zod trading cards signed by Miura himself. <laughs> I don't know if you have seen it already, this 
completely amazing. Like all those yeah. cards signed by Miura. Um, and he sent us a gift with a plethora of different Zod trading cards. And honestly, this is amazing. I've like we've never gotten anything like that from fans. Just as a gift, nothing expected in return. And this those are actually the first ones we own. I've never came to touch one of those trading cards before. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, I I never like I, I knew trading cards like from Star Wars, but not uh, yeah. from Berserk. So I was I was honestly uh, also surprised that these existed and even in such a like high quality. Yeah, like they are from two thousand three. Like is when they were uh, started, and I think they went producing for a few years. So they're pretty old and in such a good shape. So thank you. I thought we might talk about those cards for a little bit. Because I think they look awesome. They're all in Japanese and you will we will blend in a few pictures. And I think most of them like we we've seen a few of those scenes already in on our podcast, right? Yep. Like the one sure. where Zod is standing in front of Guts in that castle siege where they first met. This one is amazing. It's basically giving us colored versions of the manga panels. I know you're not the biggest fan, as you said, in the most recent uh, um, episode of the um, colored panels, but I think those are amazing. I I honestly have to agree there, um, especially because they or or he, yeah, he he didn't. Uh, how do you say? He he didn't exaggerate the color. You know, mm. they, they, the colors are more like complementing the existing panel, but he he didn't like put the colors in too, too much or he didn't exaggerate it. I don't know. He, he, he didn't overcolor it, so to say. I don't know how to, mm. I don't know if it's English, but I think you, you get the gist what I mean. Yeah. Those colors are all very, um, rather dark and muted. Yeah. Yeah. And I like these more than all these, all these, uh, I don't know, luminous colors that are put on on some of the of the volume mm-hmm. covers yeah. by by the studio by 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 Mura. No, no, no bashing, of course, but <laughs> I think these. I think it's pretty fitting to use more dark colors for Berserk than 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 luminous colors. Yeah, I think glaring. Yeah, something like glaring might be a good word for those rather bright yeah, panels. Yeah, yeah and. Uh, those cards are definitely not among them. Um, and I, I wonder, probably the, the company Konami behind those cards was um, responsible for this, but I wonder if Miura took part in the coloring or if he, you know, gave his permission to, to check <laughs> those and then, okay, he, he was satisfied because they look all very good. Frankly, there's not one card amongst them which I don't like. Honestly, my uh, I I have to I have to still think about it, but I think my favorite one is probably either the one where where he slashes his way through the soldiers riding on his horse, mm. or where he is um, in his apostle form in front of Guts and shouts his his very his prophecy, so to say, where he says Guts will experience a death he can never escape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think my favorite one is. <laughs> the one where he's also in his apostle form, but where all is very greenish. And ah, yes, with those yeah. wings, I think it looks so <coughs> sinister. Almost as if there were little flames flickering in his eyes. Yeah. I think I think this is uh isn't it also from a volume or from a from a artwork by Miura? Yeah, probably. I can't really recall the scene. It looks as if he's about to go off into the sky. Or just landed something like this. Um, ah, well, not well enough informed here, but also the one where he's flying above that snowy landscape. Do you know from which that scene is, or That's from probably, which chapter? Uh, I would I would say it's probably from Conviction, but I know, uh, but I don't know if it's after uh, after the incident at the Tower of God or before that. Mm. But I think it's around the conviction arc, hmm. <laughs> and also the one where he's flying beneath the moon, with the 
with Charlotte's bed in his, in his hands. <laughs> yeah. This is so iconic. Yeah. I always use it on Instagram as a sticker because it looks so so mystical with the moon in the back. Yeah, casually just taking the prince's bed and flying ar flying her around yeah. so that Griffith can have his back shots on her. Oh, come on. I, I was going to say <laughs> it's some uh, uh, harsh kidnapping, but you but you just overstressed it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to hold back from any further bullshit. <laughs> no, 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 you're good, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think uh, that I, it sometimes looks a bit like uh, 3D or CGI use. Do you know what I mean? Like this one where he, where he stands in front of guts where they first meet. I don't know if I, if I, if I, if my brain is already just too... Um to algorithm with all with all this stuff but <laughs> between all those soldier corpses yeah, yeah um, i think it's just coloring that makes it look yeah, very 3d be. plastic but yeah that could definitely be because i i used it i think i used it as a uh, thumbnail for one of our last episodes and it's pretty much the exact same panel i would say so it's probably just the coloring Yeah, coloring plays such such a huge role it's yeah it's amazing we already talked about it I don't know if I if I have still um, though I downloaded a few pictures to show you, but I don't know if they're still on my <laughs> computer. I will blend them in because I cannot find them. Like there is, there's two versions of that fairy house in that forest I discovered on the internet, and one of them I really don't like because the colors are so no no uh, hate to the to the artist but uh, because they're so glaring and the other one i truly admire and it's like the the very same scene but still it gives completely different feelings and that's that's the crazy thing about coloring that you just yeah. thought okay this might be 3d but it's probably yeah I, i'd say it's the coloring and shading I think it's also uh, the same thing when it comes to uh, adapting the manga into an anime. Like, look on all the different styles or attempts to adapt it and how they were received by by the audience and by the by the public. You know, like how how much simple changes or this the style itself can simply change about the whole experience. Like it's it's still the the same story we're talking about after all, mm. but the I don't know, but the outcome of the whole production and the whole style is just or the execution so to say the execution of the whole style uh, plays such a such a big role in in how it how it looks at the end uh, how how like, well yeah. it's designed. <laughs> Now I want to talk about Arch Studio again. <laughs> <laughs> I will refrain from it. Yeah, mine. <laughs> All right, one one thing one thing we can say about them before we move on is like they did a better job than the 2016 and 70 anime studio, which is not such a I will I don't want to say difficult thing to say, but uh, like look at the colors of. Uh, I think you, uh, like you're they... talking about sorry, you're talking about art students. I thought you were referring to the the trading cards. <laughs> sorry, no, yeah, because because you said completely. you wanted to say uh, yeah, more yeah, about yeah. art studio. Uh, like, of course, in the 2016 and 70 anime, there was like a lot of work, and I think if a lot of people like worked hard to accomplish that. But it was the fault of the of the studio heads who decided to take this art style instead of like making it 2D. And yeah, they had to work with 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 what they got so to say they like yeah. the, the big decisions were made and then they had to make the best out of their artistically way they had in between but probably wasn't that much they could actually change so yeah this is what we got <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's why i think it's it's a, a huge accomplishment to just surpass a full-time anime studio by being a like fan studio and just just being passionate about your project yeah i would love to maybe, maybe i'll go back and count in the, in the credits how many people actually worked on this the credits were very short but i i think there are they probably um listed all of them but it's it's just crazy even if if there there were 50 people it's it's just amazing it felt so co coherent and fully fleshed out so now i'm again talking about it but yeah the the props are apparent i hope <laughs> great job great job 
great job definitely yeah. like you can you can uh, you can you can i think talk hours about it and um, we will we will yeah you're right there okay so um thank you weenus too um also like i i will blend in some pictures the post postcard and the package it was done with so much love to the detail we were very surprised and appreciate it and also that you're listening to us um check him out on instagram the link is in the description and actually this was kind of the first mention i wanted to make it ties in with the second one of our weekly berserk fact Because among those cards we received was a postcard that says Massive Sword and Cards. Now you might wonder, who is that? And as you've just heard, there is a Berserk trading card game, which got published by Konami um, in 2003. And there were five sets um, of cards with a total of, if I'm not uh, uh uh wrong informed 448 different cards to collect and yeah it, it's got its own community on instagram i follow a few guys who collect those cards and i want to introduce you to one of those persons which is massive sword and cards but he is not merely a collector he also works on a very on a plethora of berserk related stuff as well I once uh, exchanged a few messages with him and he told me that he <coughs> basically makes everything that is requested. So <laughs> he has made business cards, trading cards, vinyl, decals, magnets, stickers, various reproductions like CDs or DVD covers, postcards, greeting cards, pin designs, and many, many, many more things. He says he personally just wants to make cards, but is basically interesting in trying, uh, interested in trying new things. And the the crazy thing is um, that the most, or well, what, what sticked out the most to me is that he actually translated the trading card game into English, which is amazing. It, it has never left Japan. So he actually opened up this whole thing to the English audience. And you can even get those cards in his shop so i will put a put a link uh in the description they look very very good i i honestly i would not dare to rip open the foliage <laughs> because it all looks so precious he he worked on the foliage on the design i i um like followed that process a little bit on instagram and he also made a giveaway which was so unfortunate like i i took part in it but uh, i failed there were pretty high chances to win something and like there were some guys who got picked like five times won like eight packages and i we we won nothing <laughs> but still um you can you can get them and the cool thing is you don't even need to buy anything of course if you want to print them he's got a full instruction on that as well like he has got uh, those documents online, how to print them, how to cut them, how to finish everything. It's so amazing. So you really see that it's not about the money. He's just a genuine creative person. And I think he's doing some amazing work for the Berserk community. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, uh, translating it into English, making own cards. is just so much love for the Berserk community. I, I love those people who are achieving those creative things. So many guys. I don't know about the other communities, but I'm just into the Berserk <laughs> community and they are awesome. I would honestly like try to put it in a, in a bigger kind of sense or in a bigger scheme. Like um, he is a perfect example on how passionate the Berserk community as a whole can be. Yo. And just, just not only about the card games, but fan adaptations for example yeah. art studio hmm. yeah. or or the rosine fight or all these all these um all these fan made uh, adaptations or like all these artworks all these statues like all all this i don't know trying to trying to support the whole community yeah and i think it's insane or it's a testament to how dedicated the fans are in an actual sense when it comes to berserk like i don't think that every community has such such a or such dedicated people uh 
trying to like to keep the the spirit of the whole thing on living the whole spirit of berserk and mura maybe also and that's that's just like this card game is a perfect example on how dedicated fans can be and how how much they can achieve if they just are actually or if they decide to be actually dedicated to yeah. what they're doing it's like it's like you have to not only see them as people who do it uh, solely in the berserk community but of course as artists on themselves as well but it's just great how much they're doing and accomplishing for uh, for us berserk fans yeah and like with massive sword and cuts he's one guy it's not like as if he's a company who makes money out of producing cards he's just so so passionate fan and you can really yeah. feel that looking at his post and also the few times i've not talked but exchanged messages with him he's just so genuine and nice and yeah this this is really the 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 salient feeling in the Brazil community i have had in the in those few months i've been kind of into that um it's it's, sim guys. it's simply great how like of course to every community community there are disadvantages not disadvantages but um negative sides as well mm, yeah. um but i think Lawrence and me or Lawrence and i i i'm supposed to be an english teacher <laughs> Lawrence <laughs> and i yeah <laughs> Lawrence and I. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, Lawrence and I <laughs> never really had negative incidents or or happenings when it came to the community. Like there were no. never yeah. people who who insulted us or who were who were completely negative in an overall sense. No. I think we simply had only positive encounters so far. So far, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I like true, yeah. like looking at the at the size of the community. Like there is a myriad of of people in in the whole community and there are so many people and i think the, ch the chances aren't even that low that something negative could could happen but as for now um lawrence and i were never affected by any uh, any negativism of the community i think so far and i hope this will stay the same yeah let's see <laughs> so far everything's great and <laughs> this isn't even the most amazing i mean you could argue about that the most amazing thing i discovered about massive sword and cards there's one more fact i want to drop that intrigued me probably the most it is that he um, is responsible for a whole tabletop simulator that you can play from the berserk trading card game how great is that like you can find it on steam um, and it says This is a fan-localized version of Berserku, <laughs> uh, a trading card game from 2003 that never left Japan. And it says, what's included? English rulebook, fully translated and graphically re recreated cards, official and player-made pre-constructed decks, Berserk-themed room and playmat, <laughs> sets 1 to 3 completed, and full art variants of selected cards. And there are also some future goals inclu included, something like... Uh, doing volumes four and five, some ex, uh, expansion packs and other things. Uh, like, this is so amazing. I'm, I honestly consider if I will look into it, if I find the yep. time, I will definitely pay it a visit. It's just, it's just amazing. Like, <laughs> doing mind, such mind a game you, from you, scratch. If you send me over the name again, then I will look it up and put it on my Steam wish list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I will do. And also the link will be included and there's also a discord server of him i don't know if there are other guys included if so i'm, I'm sorry for not <laughs> representing you i i think it's only him but probably i'm wrong so and it also recently got an update uh, update also got a youtube channel there you can see a little uh, some gameplay of it you might want to look into that um yeah like i haven't looked into it yet but i heard it's plays like magic the gathering so if you have played that one you probably won't have a hard time playing the berserk trading card game but all those guys who my following on instagram are basically showing their collection collecting but i don't know if if it's a thing to to actually play it i don't know i had a lot uh, lots of pokemon cards as a child but i i just played around with them like they were statues you know i have never never played the actual game <laughs> 
I don't know. Yeah, how. sadly me neither, but uh, I think I will pay to visit. Yeah, so you would consider trying it out? Like, are yeah, you definitely. the card game guy? Maybe we can... Not not really, but I think uh, just uh, just looking into what the community has, has accomplished, not only in, in artworks or <laughs> adaptations, but maybe also in video games. Like, interest, I'm interested in the other side. Okay. Maybe, 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 maybe we can even do a little video on it if it's to our uh, in our interest and it's fun to play and we both want to do it, then who knows? <laughs> who uh, knows? Who knows? Yeah, this could probably never represent the entirety of what he's doing, but uh, yeah, if you want to dive, de- uh, dive deeper, dive deeper, uh, you <laughs> probably <laughs> should start at the Discord channel or Instagram page. Um, so yeah crazy that that uh Venus 2 just sent uh us that that postcard which i i completely overlooked it and kind of and when when i uploaded the post um he commented beneath oh i i saw that postcard uh before and i was like okay hold on it was from Venus, but it says massive sword and cards how is that possible <laughs> then i he kind of uh, educated me that that he's also doing stuff like that he educated you. All right. Yeah, That's he great. educated me. Sorry for the lack of a better word. Yeah. No, no, I think it's right. Like we, we as guys still have to learn. We have to learn much what is actually happening in the whole community. Like we're, we're just coming from the side and just starting. So there's a lot we still have and want to do. Yeah, I'm completely scratching the surface. I have to say for me, also when it comes to the Berserk itself, I am, I mean, I mean, our description on YouTube says it, on Instagram as well. We are no experts, but especially that goes for me. I'm really no expert. Like, uh, I probably don't even know everything that happens in the manga anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think nobody knows. Nobody knows, yeah. I think I think there's, there's so much stuff maybe Mira thought of and already hinted in details that that will never be discovered. <laughs> until Zodcast re- <laughs> discloses <laughs> everything. And okay. until we talk about every little detail. Yes. Okay, so I think that's it for our uh, weekly Berserk fact. And yeah, thank you guys for being so open in the community and achieving such great things. And also thank you, Venus2, for those great cards. We still have to split them, Corny. Just tell me your favorite ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want to, of course, uh, you can have them all. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I was very happy when it came in. I was like, no way. It, it said uh, um, Zodcast fan club on the on the uh, package. <laughs> so That's very so sweet. lovely. That's yeah. So sweet. Yeah. Yeah, our our uh, audience is um, the best. <laughs> our, our audience is the best and uh, still growing, and that's that makes that makes me happy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like I hope I hope actually that people listen from from start to finish just to hear our pointless rambling sometimes about <laughs> about these panels and what might not and what could be yeah I, I okay recently i was thinking about because i have to i have to go go abroad someday for university so i hope we will be able to keep it up you know recording yeah. once every week and i will I, i'm really anticipating the huge rise in my english skills once i've been a few months in i don't know scotland new zealand wherever uh that will be funny to witness i think <laughs> that will, yeah you can you can like um you can make zodcast meetings uh up there and uh in the foreigner so yeah yeah you, you just like do fan club meetings uh, <laughs> in in for our sake and yeah and yeah. uh and that would be cool. I probably would have to go to America because I've seen the statistics that most of our viewers or listeners on YouTube, like a quarter, like 25%, a little bit above, are from the USA. And the second, second most, uh, yo, uh, you know what I mean, <laughs> is uh, Britain. And then I think like with something like 4% Germany. So like half of our listeners are scattered around the whole world so maybe there's also one guy from new zealand i can meet up there (laughs) but that's great like being uh being entangled with people all over the world i think that's that's kind of a blessing um that we that we like get to know new people and uh that are not in germany but maybe also learning about stuff that is happening in 
in communities overseas and in other countries. Yeah, overseas most literally. And I, I like, I'm really glad that we eventually decided to do it in English because, of course, yes, probably we we could be more poetic or whatever in German, but I think it's we're decent enough to to convey our points. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just trying to use the most uh, simple and basic language, and sometimes even these words fail to come to mind, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and putting putting our ideas in words and just trying to explain what we are thinking about certain stuff. Yeah, that's Sotcast. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, so want to go to the chapters content. We start with a beautiful panel of Princess Charlotte standing beneath an autumn tree that's losing its leaves, playing with her carefully decorated braids. And the chapter is called Assassin, chapter one, <laughs> which already comes along with huge implications, keeping in mind last episode where Minister Foss suggested Julius to kill Griffith with a poisoned arrow. So, you know, one might think there's going to happen something today. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, like, only maybe something will happen. Maybe Griffith will die this day and, sure. um, and the whole story ends right here. Um, but I think it's also important to say that, uh, especially considering the last episode... The king stated in the last chapter that seldom Charlotte ventures outside the castle. So I think it's also worth mentioning that actually this time she is outside the castle, even though it happens rarely. Uh, do you think that's that's because of the honorable incident, not incident, uh, that is happening today? Like the honorable situation of this royal hunt? Or do you think it's rather because of the of the character that is Griffith and who is very <laughs> charming around around Charlotte? Sweet question. Um, I don't know if she got convinced by the nobleman to actually join the hunt for once, but I think she's probably, after that incident with Griffith, she probably wants to see that guy again, oh, yeah, I'd guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, like being interested in who this commoner might be who like resembles nobility more than every nobleman we've get to know so far yeah i mean she's she's playing with her hair um whom is she thinking about <laughs> we, <laughs> we could interpret <laughs> not that it has to be that this way but uh yeah she she seemed to be very uh um intrigued in a positive way by that man um in a positive way, yeah, like until a certain point, but um, uh, we'll talk about that. Right, uh, right now we're we're uh, on the royal hunt, and dogs are hunting this fox who tries to flee, but um, mm. doesn't come too far. Like there, are, there are all these noblemen on the band of the hawk, especially who are supporting this hunt and mm. like making it as as soft for the king as possible like uh, this this tradition ba back in med medieval was like I th in my opinion so meaningless like this this king or a nobleman can be satisfied and say all right i hunted down this animal even though all his folks and servants like hunted it before him and just put the, the animal in the right position and mm -hmm. so the nobleman could just deliver the final blow i think it's I think it's pretty cheap when you think about it just for the nobleman so that he yeah, can yeah. be saying that, all right, I was the guy who who killed it and I'm still in shape, even though, like, look at the king. He isn't <laughs> in shape for anything anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much cheap self-assurance. I yeah. thought for some diehard mercenaries who are killing people all the time and mm -hmm. putting their <laughs> lives at stake, this could be somewhat uplifting and relieving. I mean, we will see if that goes for everyone, but... uh for those noblemen, it's pretty much uh, useless. And also, th uh, those nobles having their superficial conversations with the king, it's just so hilarious how they essentially say nothing relevant, just kiss his highness's arse. Like, look at, w would your majesty care to join the chase once? No, I wish not to. I would soon tire at my age, blah, 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 blah. And, and they are just like, oh, how magnanimous. And even even Julius is isn't indulging in playing all polite and yeah, like, bourgeois. 
like Julius is the one that is least resembling nobility and high standard and this this uh this use of language like mm. he like of course he it's it's kind of weird because we saw in the last chapter that he really cares about status but he doesn't care about behaving like a nobleman Do like he only cares about mm. his position and not how to behave in that certain position I wonder if he's always been like that or if it's just because he's very in a stressful state because of that Griffith. Because as you said, he cares a lot about those uh, behaving noble and being respectful towards the king, but he himself looks like a commoner in noble clothes, like in the way he acts and he's ruling yeah. all the time. Maybe he would be different on that hunt if it wasn't for Griffith partaking. Yeah, he's, he's pretty rough and rude uh, to other people. Um, and we get f further context to that uh, later on when we when we meet his son and his and we learn about this backstory. But still, it's it's kind of weird, and I I wouldn't call it paradoxical, but it's like uh, an an character trait that is kind of not fitting with each other. Being this man who cares so much about uh, about high standard and being a noble man, but at the same time. He never really does anything, so you could think that he actually is a nobleman. Mm. Yeah, just caring as to prevent those commoners from yeah. from mingling <laughs> and with nobleman. Maybe, maybe caring about your power and yeah. caring about that power so much that you will or you won't ever give it away for nothing in the world. Yeah, and. Uh, as <laughs> yeah, as said, Griff is the better nobleman. Yeah, probably. Like, like, like look behavior. at him, how he sits on the horse. He looks, he <sighs> looks just, he looks more attractive. <laughs> uh, yeah. He looks, he looks better. He has a better armor. He just looks more like the guy uh, that is born within this, when it, within these high social ranks. Yeah. Like, we are joking a lot, about also, especially about Griffith, but let's be honest. Griffith is undeniably beautiful <laughs> yeah he's, like he's look he's at really this handsome. panel he's so graceful with his serene appearance ah, yeah, I, graceful that's really the right word like yeah. this panel like his ears and his hair make him look so soft truly aesthetic i <laughs> i have to say yeah like gra this panel, graceful like. is the right word to use here i think hmm. Hmm. and uh like look at julius <laughs> he isn't he's, <laughs> he isn't graceful at all like of course you could say he's past his prime but still, this head and the That's haircut on him and on, and his clothes look kind of, kind of hilarious when comparing it to Griffith. Yeah, I think every person can put on a um, decent, humble, and gentle look. So probably it's not about his appearance per se, but he's just grumpy all the time. So yeah, he's of course, grumpy. It's hard to match Griffith's uh, beauty standard, <laughs> but uh, he's just nice. Although oftentimes playing nice like Griffith but, yeah uh, yeah I and um, I think I think <laughs> who might be even lower when coming to appearances is the guy that that's with behind Julius with a crossbow yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, who will, will probably be the one who maybe tries to assassinate Griffith like like look at the looks that are ex that they are exchanging and how yeah. he looks, like uh, the 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 expression on his face, he, he just looks, I don't know, like really stupid. <laughs> he's the country bumpkin Casca was talking about. Yes. <laughs> like, okay, he's got a crossbow, nothing too unusual on a hunting ground, but we know this time, judging from their eye contact, okay, yeah, something is crooked. So, yeah, yeah, they they're they're pr planning something. Yeah, and <laughs> we see that guts also work can work as a dog in this case. Like he <laughs> can bark like a dog to shoo those foxes. And here we have it again. Come on, guys. It's become undeniably the dog parallel. Zodcast officially laid open the recurring theme. Guts is being compared to a dog by himself by by himself he's not yeah, he's, he's not barking. it's not it's not Casca this time who mentioned it he really has become the one thing he never wanted <laughs> to be uh, he dark. became the very <laughs> thing that that Casca always said about him and now he's he's the incarnation of everything he feared to become 
Ja, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, the fox is like pretty shocked. <laughs> uh, you know, like yeah, he's, yeah. he's an animal, he's a wild animal, but still he looks like, all right, this is Guts. I have to get out of here as quick as possible. Hmm. And uh, yeah, they're actually complimenting Guts for you did it, boy. So he hmm. seems pretty skilled when it comes to scaring animals uh, or yeah. maybe scaring demons and apostles later on. Uh, and yeah, he's like, he's not, he's not, He's not caring about all that. He's just, all right, this is my job. So what, why do you care? Yeah. In this case, he looks like he has fun when he's barking. But after that, he pretty much complains about this whole thing. Yeah. This shows again the disparity between Guts and all the other guys from the Band of the Hawk. Like yeah. their lifestyle. He complains about that task and that hunt. And Until yeah, would rather yeah. swing his sword around on the battlefield. And ah, it's so hard because... I don't know. I know Corcus is oftentimes an idiot and he's annoying and rages all the time, but I kind of understand him here. Like, yeah. when you're worrying for your life every time you're on the battlefield and wish for nothing more than someday becoming maybe rich and retire, that kind of attitude Guts represents comes off really repelling. Like, still for, for Guts, this is his life, at least a big part of it, like fighting as for now, but uh, yeah, it's kind of weird because Corcus is so happy to have this privilege being on that hunt not being at risk and i yeah completely understand him here yeah like uh guts is uh saying that he, or he's complaining why he why they have to serve the the noblemans and he he just says it feels more natural when he's swinging the sword around but yeah i understand you and i understand the Corcus at the moment like they don't have to be scared of killing right now and they and it's kind of like talking about social privileges it's a big honor to be yeah, on the on yeah. the hunt with the king of midland himself like i think most people would dream about this their whole life to just meet the king and be with him for this for this day and just serving him and maybe maybe showing him that you are worth something but uh yeah it's like it's like simply guts as we talked about in the last episodes, he doesn't really care about the social status and all the nobility, just like Shrek. <laughs> Come on, don't give me that comparison again. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, like big parts of the noble class are even enraged by them partaking in this, so they can really feel lucky to be in that place. And it's so interesting, like Guts his whole life, he's been around mercenaries all the time, so this way of living kind of hadn't been noticed as something super weird or repelling per se by anyone it's basically what they all did okay Casca is weirded out by him rushing in and uh not seemingly not caring about others but anyways like if you had given some of those mercenaries for example a bunch of gold big enough to provide for the rest of their life probably lots of them would have thrown away their weapon without any hesitation like sure i don't want to stay on the battlefield my whole life i want to retire but that does not seem to be the case for guts like corcus is obviously also not the type of guy who fights for fun but for guts this is just like his yeah his way of living imagine guts living among quote-unquote completely normal people he'd be seen as the insane killer in no time like we have this over and over again the story where he meets yeah, normal people and they think okay this man may have just saved me but he also looks like the complete nightmare i wouldn't want to encounter at night in a forest you know like yeah. he is the monster it's himself but also very much a person so yeah it's, yeah like like he sees uh he can be viewed as uh as the monster as you said but at the end he's he, he would never like attack you without uh -huh. reason at the night but still he he looks like the monster who could or who would do it even though he probably would just simply not care about you if you're if you're not to his interest or in your way hmm. yeah killing fool says Crocus. <laughs> if you yeah, like swing, i mean you yeah swore that he, much he is kind of a killing fool like he's not a fool in that literal literal sense he's he's not dumb but he is but maybe foolish to risk his life rather than going yeah. on a neat little hunt yeah. yeah like like in certain aspects he resembles a fool and like of course it's guts and change doesn't happen happen overnight so corcus and casca can shout at him all they want but at the end 
it's not that simple for guts like being being another person that that comes with time and with experience and with hurtful experience uh, yeah. and he still has to learn what it means to maybe let go of the sword and let go of hatred and like maybe just live and not completely identify yourself through the sword like he says for him living is fighting on the battlefield but maybe later on yeah. there will be more than that yeah this is literally what he has been doing if we look at his life there has been no cut as of yet in that scheme he's always been fighting um no matter if he if in solitude or with those different mercenary gangs but this might be the first period of time where they're having let's say some leisure time <laughs> yeah and yeah probably yeah probably so that uh, that they maybe can take a pause and a break from all the killing and oh, of course like the suffering comes later on but uh <laughs> like after the hunt they immediately go to the next uh, war in their campaign to free midland yeah so it's maybe also a moment of reflection no matter if he if he wants to or not because after yeah um crocus has been raging on for for a moment he look at his look he he doesn't respond in words but he i don't know i think he looks a little bit annoyed but uh, at crocus but thoughtfulness is probably the dominating feeling since there's some some truth of course in what crocus said which makes him think about his life probably what do you say as a professional interpreter <laughs> <laughs> who, who has been flourishing in his a levels like would you say he's uh he's thinking about his life at that moment like he he doesn't uh counter or give a counter attack to Corcus and says shut up or something like that he just remains silent i like this question um <laughs> I think, all right, like calling me a professional interpreters is maybe a bit a, a bit overstating, but oh, no. um, we have already s we have already seen in the last chapters, for example, where uh, when Guts was on the rooftop and just looked at the night in the night sky with a sword in his hands, he really re reflected on his own life, on his words and the words of Griffith and what makes a man worth living or what, what makes life in a more general sense, maybe like achieving a dream. And uh, he really, really tries to maybe like find this certain spark in him that can like kindle the dream he wants to, he wants to find. Like as of right now, he has no idea what that looks like, but he tr still tries to find it. So he actually thinks about something more important to him or what could be more important to him than war so i think he he understands crocus in the moment like that for some people nobility isn't unimportant of course for him for for guts it isn't important but the but the thing crocus is talking about in more in a more deeply sense uh, or in a more deeply layer is not only the nobility but that guts is solely identifying himself through the sword mm. and Maybe that triggers in guts this certain I don't know his 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 look almost resembles sadness that he maybe at the moment actually can't think of something more than fighting even though he wants to have something more than fighting. <laughs> You're not calling yourself the professional interpreter, but it's basically what you just did. <laughs> like the sadness part is now that you've talked about it, completely obvious, and I think it's very applicable to say what you just did and it's yeah maybe maybe at at first when he met Korgos he was always pissed by him pissed off by him yeah but, I, uh, I am also <laughs> me too yeah yeah <laughs> by Korgos yeah, yeah and uh but now that he's kind of started his uh reflecting on his own life probably this this encounter with Korgos um works more as a um an additional incentive for keeping on reflecting on on the way he's living than a huge annoyance so yep yeah, yeah like maybe, he, he maybe yeah. he maybe is just simply too lost in his thoughts to fight back to what is cork is saying like yeah. that 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 point or the words that are triggering uh the thoughts inside of him that he 
that he also tries to search for for a different meaning in his life is like mm. so heavy that he can't even be annoyed by the words Crocker said. Rather, like yeah. he's he's too too much spacing out for even for even being being annoyed by that. Yeah, those those it it just resonates with him. Like those outside situations with Corcus, for example, that we're looking at now, mirror what he's been pondering about in the inside. So uh it's really interesting. He's basically not being a fool, although he's acting like one, like Corcus. So he is saying truth there in a very harsh way, which is why why it yeah, resonates in guts. Resonates in guts. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it it it's resonating a lot of in him, and we see that uh, throughout the whole Golden Age arc, or not throughout the ho throughout the whole, but rather to the end of the campaign, and uh, of course later on with the with the talk with Tkaska, uh, the Bonfire of Dreams, these are so important conversations to Guts that are always reminding him that he wants to have. A dream, but he still can't really find it or or uh, put it into words. What he what he wants besides uh, his sword fighting. Yeah, Corny, I already like this episode. I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> like this is so this is so complex. Berserk is so nice. I I am already anticipating that scene. Oh, uh, yeah, bonfire definitely. of dreams. I love this there, one. It will there. be included. I will I will say it. I'm currently working on an hard style berserk edit yeah might come off a little bit weird but uh the the scene the bonfire of dreams will be included and i'm yeah i'm eager to see what you guys think about it I just i'm, I'm also it. eager to see what you are what who, what you will cook and uh, <laughs> yeah i am cooking <laughs> and and what what will it turn out like it's uh you said it's uh, it's hard style so it will probably be completely different to what i Edited, Very different, but I'm yeah. but I'm but I'm still looking forward to that. I I I don't want to perpetuate the, I don't I don't know if cliche is the right word. I know a lot of people like hardstyle is a very special taste. I get that many people would say okay, it completely doesn't fit with Berserk. But basically, what I'm trying is to make it fit. So um, you can tell me afterwards. You also, Connie, if you if you think I did a good job. If not, uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna be sad at you. <laughs> but um, sad at you that's not a thing you can say mad at you sorry <laughs> um i think coming back to your statement about all the scenes that you are anticipating i think there are like thousands of moments <laughs> yeah. in berserk that i really anticipate to talk about like there's so so much um that that will be that will be just give us pure fuel of our imaginations to to just yeah, I'll talk about it and ramble for hours about what is happening in just one panel. Yeah, one panel I want to ramble about a little bit is the look of Casca that we got, and um, like she was watching Corcus's and Guts's one-sided argument <laughs> with a rather neutral, interested look, I would say, and I believe that she is beginning to understand that guts is not the asshole she believed he'd be like yeah. i wouldn't go as far to say that she understands him no that is yet to come but she at least assumes there to be an underlying reason for this way of behaving other than being an egoistic asshole which is a start <laughs> yeah yeah i i wanted to say the same like she probably was a bit surprised that uh guts didn't didn't shout at, at corcus mm -hmm. and wasn't annoyed and maybe like uh has has drawn his sword to to chop off Corcus's head. I think she was a bit surprised by his really calm behavior. Yeah. It's already starting the opening up process. Like those people not not already getting interested in each other, but at least not hating each other. That's a good one. <laughs> 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 and then she she turns her attention to Princess Charlotte, who is turning away from the hunt because she's horrified by the pictures of animals being hunted and killed. Yeah, yeah I mean... She's like she, the typical... At, at the mm. moment, she's the typical cliche for what a for what a innocent princess looks like, but she won't be innocent after all so much later on. Um, I think I think at the, at the moment, yeah, she is kind of a cliche, but later on, it's, it's 
it's always the same in Brazil. Like I feel you, bad for her. I wouldn't say that she will she won't be innocent. Like she 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 has no say in what happens to her, basically. Yeah, of course. Like I, I wanted to say that in Brazil many characters at first uh seem kind of maybe maybe superficial or not very mm. interesting or kind of cliche. But as the story progresses it all more leads to uh discovering the deep layers of the character and how complex they actually are. And I think uh Charlotte like of course like sh I think she's no one's favorite character, but even she has uh she has her own desires, wishes and her backstory and maybe also dreams and things she she cares about. So it's It's not as simple as all oh, right. She's this one princess uh, who who wants to be saved by this by this uh, shiny shiny knight. It's uh, there. There's more to her character than that. Yeah, you're right. I agree. <laughs> And <laughs> then the the man you just talked about appears out from the under. Uh, how do you say uh, undergrowth from the thickets? And <laughs> yeah, she's talking about how how men care about nothing more than bloodshed. And I think it's so funny. Like, it's this is a typical Griffith thing for me to do. It's a little bit random, but as if to disprove her by doing something not very manly and brutal, you know, Griffith takes a leaf from a nearby tree, puts it between his lips and starts to whistle. Like, <laughs> it's, this is so funny. Like, she's, ah, oh, men are all about bloodshed and war, yeah. and he just takes a leaf and whistles with it. This yeah. seems, yeah, to impress her. <laughs> uh, Griffith really knows how to charm a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sad thing to say, but honestly, <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. yeah. That was uh, very uh, appropriate, this this way of... Uh, Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, <laughs> she, uh, she admits, as you said, that, like, all that is nowadays important is bloodshed and cruelty and, and war and men heading into war. And she, I think she, she can't stand it anymore. I mean, she's not really affected by the war itself, but she's, um, I think she's, yeah, is she, is she 14 or 15 years old? So she Something really like can't that. comprehend the whole size of what is happening in, in the, in the Midland and the war itself. Like she can't put it in a sense or she can't cope with the actual suffering a war can, can cause in the, in the country. Hmm. And even though Griffith is the head of this, yeah, genius, but also, of course, brutal mercenary band. He looks as if he's not isolated from that horror, but as if he's completely sane and also has some space in his head for fun things like whistling, you know? Like, m many people might be completely dramatized from the war, and that's probably why they, why, why uh, Charlotte is horrified by them. So Griffith is this out outstanding um, exception of a man. Who does not look as if he's the brutal war fighter? Yeah, that's and the that's the masquerade of of Griffith. I would say like this, this really innocent face covering up yeah. the, uh, yeah, the maybe the inside. cruelty <laughs> and narcissism he he re he he bears inside of him. Completely, yeah, and yeah, they're having this their little uh, whistle concert on that hill, and <laughs> all Julius can say to that is just. <laughs> and <laughs> high and mighty is what he says as if he's anything different you know yeah uh, as if yeah. he's any better yeah and yeah they're still waiting for their chance to assassinate that formidable white-haired thicket musician and as if causality wants it to happen wait 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 yes uh i think we still need to talk about Like we we ah, we we saw Julius' perspective yeah. on Griffith, but on the, oh, <laughs> but on the on the on the other hand uh, of the, on the other on the other side of the hill, uh, is Casca uh, with. The, I'm sorry for skipping that beautiful with, book. Let's go into it. Yeah, with the other members of the band of the Hawk, and like they're all looking up to to Griffith and Charlotte, and I and I think they all like kind of kind of know. All right, Griffith has to. I don't know, charm Charlotte and he has to get to know her and maybe like lifting up his chances for for his mission and his and his dream and his goal. 
But uh, what do you think about about Casca's face and what thoughts are flowing through her mind? Uh, good question. I, I plan to ask you the same. But I would say, like, as you said, some other guys probably might think, okay, this is what he has to do. He said he needs to play along those noble rules of chit-chatting. But just just look at her. She she looks very enchanted by Griffith. She probably, yeah, has watched the whole interplay between them and uh, I find no words to describe it. Like her eyes are halfly closed. She's blushing. She almost looks as if she's in a dream state, like taking far away by, by the <laughs> gentle and mesmerizing way in which Griffith acts. Maybe even imagining her next to him on that hill. That is just <laughs> pure uh, pure imagination here. But yeah, I would say she is just in love with the way how Griffith acts, how soft and gentle he can be. So yeah, I enchanted. What's your take on this? She's probably jealous. <laughs> but she doesn't look jealous. Uh, right? Yeah, she doesn't really look jealous, but I think she would more like to be on that hill instead of Charlotte. Being, yeah, being sure, next to sure. Griffith and like being at his side more than anyone else. I think she's a little bit away from that state where she's just completely jealous all the time. Maybe maybe she's gotten a little bit uh, used to those hard feelings in the last moments. Uh, in the, oh gosh, sorry, my English today. Like in the with all that has happened between her guts and Griffith. Yep, so maybe yeah, probably she she's, she yeah. got used to it, but still I think she would wish for the things to be different. Yo. But maybe she begins to accept that this is the way it is and yeah, Griffith has to act like that. She knows that so whistling on a leaf on that hill is probably also not the most romantic thing. Although it looks very romantic in that scene. <laughs> Am I right? Like, the way they look at each other, Charlotte and uh, Chris. Yeah, definitely. Him closing his eyes and she blushing again, like, you just showed me how to whistle with a leaf. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. Uh, she's already intrigued by Griffith. Yeah, this she, is such She's a, already falling for him. Like, of course, she's, uh, thing, she's yeah. still in, a, in teenage... In, in yeah, her th that's why years. it's so bad. Yeah. So yeah. She's, she's not, like, mature enough to see through his, uh, I don't know, facade... No. And you can't, you honestly, you can't blame her for that. But it's just the way it is that he is, hmm. he is completely, I don't know, convincing her of himself. Yeah, yeah. I, Griffith is the one character that's hard to interpret. But I would say, although I completely, I'm completely on board with you, with this idea that he's, you know, already knowing. Okay, Charlotte is a stepping stone he still is himself in that scene on that hill. Like he, the way he's picking that leaf could just be him bathing with guts and talking <laughs> about random things, you know, like he's not, he's not completely acting. Although the reason why he went there is probably to impress her, you know? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, then uh, you already tried to say it, uh, said, say it before I, I had to interrupt Shoot. you. Um, as yeah. causality maybe wanted it to happen, a mm -hmm. boar, a wild boar, rushes out of the woodwork and like completely, I don't know, shocks the horse of Charlotte. So yeah. it breaks breaks through and just runs away. Yeah. And Griffith immediately follows her while his assassin sees this opportunity and prepares for taking him down. Yeah. And yeah, he, he quickly Waiting. catches up. Just yeah, like he he says, wait until he's alone. So of course, yeah, honestly, it's always the best when a person is uh, alone, so you can assassinate it. But still, but still, I'm if I think about it right now, like Minister Foss's plan wasn't so bad. Like saying, all right, there there will be arrows on the hunt, so maybe an arrow like losing it and maybe. Uh, piercing it's through Griffith is still not that good yeah <laughs> yeah it's still not that good like you could have him sitting in his room in the castle and like five I don't know big assassins entering the room and just beating him to death you know 
<laughs> yeah, no one would if they cleared all the traces, no one would have known what happened. And in this time, like there's no even no no game behind, no fox behind them. So it's somewhat weird that this arrow is he's let's say he's a bit too stray, you know? Yeah. And like, uh, why is an arrow flying in that direction? And even even if it was an accident, then there would like there there would be a person who's like, Oh, I'm so sorry, you know, but there's just one random arrow so everyone knows this is planned. Yeah, kind yeah, really. And uh, yeah. I think it's also kind it's of weak. Uh, you you have to judge uh, Julius for that because like in the last chapter he w- he was so enraged that he probably like took every chance he had to to make sure Griffith would be killed. So I think it's 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 not unreasonable because like Julius was out of his mind, but it there would be have better executions for this plan. Yeah, completely. And oh. I like again the the uh how the panels are composed. Look at this um, crossbow protruding from the actual frame. So uh, going above above its uh, limitations, you know what I mean? <laughs> like the, the, the panel where the assassin is holding his crossbow. Yeah. And it's just uh, overlapping the actual panel. Yeah. This is so cool. Yeah. It looks so uh, 3D and... Yeah. Yeah, uh, like uh, like it like it pierces out of the panel and directly yes, yes, into yes. into our eyes. <laughs> into Griffith's yeah. face. It's yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> like uh, SAT uh, catches up and calms down the horse so they they're all good. Um she's not hurt. And but she is all over the place crying out of relief. Uh, he's just like it's all right with this funny anime anime face or manga face. Yeah. And and, and, she, and Charlotte uh, actually like tries to hug him or really hugs him because he like mm. simply calmed her horse down like yeah look look at his face when she's hugging him i don't know if i'm completely over interpreting uh, this but he o- almost looks a little bit sad like or melancholic like okay she's she's so freaked out just because this happened this is clearly a young girl that's what i thought when i looked at yeah. his face you know, like, uh, what am I doing here? I don't know. Or completely uh, th- calculating through. <laughs> I think more like he's still, even though he sees her as this kind of instrument that he can use for his for his journey up to the throne of Midland, he's still mm. distanced from actually kind of taking a liking to her, you know, still seeing her very differentiated just as this tool he can use and not as a person he likes. Yeah, it sounds so harsh, but uh, you might be, you may be true, yeah. I I always wonder if we're too harsh on Griffith, not that he's like the the nicest person in in this manga, but uh, like if he's been like this all along, but I'm on board. I'm on board. I would say, if he has yeah. been always you know? this way, yeah, I think, I think, like when maybe we... he's even caring. Like if you if you think about how he's, uh, yeah, you know, we're officially spoiler talk. So how he's acting towards uh, Charlotte later, very very much further in the story. I think although she is a tool in some sense, he is always respectful with like, without with the exception of that one scene where he's. We can argue on that, but he's not uh, respectful entering, you know, the room and all the things that happen. <laughs> but apart from, you know, but there, there he f- completely flipped because of what 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 happened. But afterwards, I think he's like, uh, he still respects her, and and we we don't see mu- much from them. But uh, he doesn't seem to to treat her badly. No, tr- not treating her bad, but um, you you said like if he's been always this way, and I think later on when he. When he's on the on the big hand and he has to make the <laughs> yeah. choice to like die or to sacrifice or not die, but maybe like give everything up or give everything up in the in another sense. And I think there are some moments and some panels we see back from the Golden Age arc where some important character traits came to came to the I don't know. To the surface. To the surface, yeah, thank you. To the surface, uh, for example, where he asked Guts, uh, do you think I'm cruel? And that still will happen, and we will also mm. talk about it. Uh, yeah. But like moments like these that show that Griffith really never were this 
this uh, innocent guy. And uh, yeah, we we knew that from the beginning, but still how actually, no, maybe how bad he is as a human, even though we, even though he always resembles like this charming, nice guy, how mm. deeply flawed yeah. and how, and yeah. how, I don't know, how little he actually cares about the people around him. Yeah, that's like the one side and I completely agree. And um, but I'm I'm still wondering if he's noticing himself being like that all the time. You know, like in the one scene he's reflecting on his life on all those situations. But it's like in this moment he almost looks as if he's reflecting and like is he's uh, is he aware of the fact that he is yeah, a mean person oftentimes and uh, kind of uh, manipulative and crossing borders everywhere. Uh, bo crossing borders, is that a thing? Yeah. I like, think as uh, well. Uh, yeah, it's the right word. Like, or stepping over how, boundaries. Boundaries is what I want to say, not borders. <laughs> like, yeah, he's crossing some borders. But uh, <laughs> boundaries, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I. It, that's why I want to see the script from Yura. Like, he probably had it all... Do, do you think, I mean, just because you're writing a person doesn't mean you have everything figured out. Do you think he completely laid open Krithis' mind in his scripts? I or think there are, there are always, like, notes in the script that are depicting who Griffith really is, but he doesn't state that in the, in the actual manga or the story, but uses these notes to, I don't know, convey the character in the story through a more, I don't know, showing sense instead of telling mm -hmm. do you want to go with me to japan on the biggest robbery done in history yes just stealing those notes yeah we will we will break in studio gaga and <laughs> I, like probably mo pr probably koji mori has these scripts so we, yeah. have to, we have to steal them from him while, while doing so we will leave a note on his uh like a uh, little table next to the bed where it says please just get those chapters out more more uh rapidly or yeah. you know like <laughs> uh, but one, one thing uh, these these scripts are like in, in japanese and uh, oh, as i as i study. always try yeah. to like japanese you you can't really put it into into deeple or google translator because there are so many like uh, you you probably can explain it better than i do but i don't know there's there are so many like uh Kanjis. Kanjis, and they all have yeah. a different meaning, and you really yeah, yeah. have to. You really depending have to, on the order, yeah. And you really have to look on the whole context so that it makes an actual sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have been studying Japanese for quite some years, but I never dig deep into the kanji stuff. Actually, just grammatic pronunciation and reading katakana and hiragana. But uh, yeah, kanjis are on a whole nother level. So maybe we will. We will take a uh, a guy who actually mm. can understand those countries with us, or or maybe just get them back to Germany, and then we will interpret here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like oh yeah, get uh, get some guy who actually can translate this for us. Yeah. Okay. So maybe if you want to support us, there will be a Patreon link in the description. <laughs> <laughs> we need to fly there after all. <laughs> no kidding, not kidding. Okay. So uh, the scene. Where were we? Uh, that uh, the hugging, assassin uh, aims, his, aims his crossbow on Griffith. Yeah, and she asks, are you... No, he asks, are you hurt at all? Guess who might be hurt in a few seconds. Um, mm -hmm. They are laughing. And he asks, what's the matter? And she says, I was scared, very scared. We have to uh, keep in mind that she seldom ventures out of the castle as the <laughs> king has explained in the last episode sorry uh, so this is probably the most frightening thing she's done in a few years yeah probably uh, like like uh besides um eating nice cupcakes and don't know reading uh fairy tales so yeah, what a shock. My heart is still pounding. I've never been on such a wild horse ride in my life. Do you know do you know who will also bring her oh, to no, be pound. No, no, no. Um, one no, no, thing I wanted to say, say you... <laughs> is yeah. that uh, I don't know, Charlotte kind of resembles in in some few parallels the daughter of the Count, like being this kind of bird in a cage or imprisoned in a cage and never really going outside. And of course it was much more forceful with the Count and his daughter, but um, 
True. And uh, yeah. but but Charlotte herself is also a person that seldom ventures outside the castle. And I don't know her, her father and her her mother don't really force her to be inside, but uh, it's more like her character that she. I don't know, is a bit too nervous or too scared to really tries to explore and discover the world that is laying outside of the castle. Yeah, she's kind of uh, putting herself in the cage, but maybe because the king has spoiled her so much, she maybe she, he, the parents are also responsible for this, but yeah. because, of, of course, like... Uh, Upbringing is always important. Yeah, they haven't... Uh, put that spark of exploring into her maybe she just uh knows her castle walls and finds pleasure within those uh activities there so yeah that's why yeah yeah he admitted it he kind of spoiled her <laughs> all right and then i think this is for me a lot harder to interpret the look on griffith's face on the panel where he says your fear seems to have already fled somewhat like of course, he's kind of nice and, I don't know, worrying about Charlotte. But still, the look on his face doesn't really seem to resemble caring about a person. I don't know yeah, if you... I know what you mean. I, yeah, I haven't thought about that look when reading through, but... Um, I think it's the most hard <sighs> panel to interpret in the whole chapter. Especially when yeah. how he how he conveys his... his his thoughts and his words where he says your fear seems to have already fled somewhat i think it's it's kind of i don't know the words aren't really fitting the facial expression or the facial expression doesn't really seem to be that honest mm, yeah yeah but maybe that's also intended like we're always <laughs> interpreting so much but I I know I know what you mean. It looks a bit rational and cold in in contrast to what he actually says. Yeah, I mean, imagine like this man stands in front of you in a dark alley with the it's same creepy, facial yeah. expression. I think you would be not really calm. You would be more scared. I think. And maybe he's thinking about something else at the same time whilst uh, uttering those words. But yeah, he looks as if he's uh, actually somewhat like a parent talking to to a little kid uh like assuring the kid that everything is all right and hey look your uh fear seems to have already fled somewhat you know like uh it's not that bad the the outer world but it's and but it's still i don't know if i'm o- over interpreting this stuff so much but he looks kind of fake i don't know as yeah. as he says that yeah i agree but i i don't know why <laughs> yeah it's it's like, really uh, hard like yeah. these words are normal and caring about charlotte but but the facial expression in my opinion doesn't fit a hundred percent to what he's saying or to yeah. the character that he is yeah maybe there is no purpose behind it you know like yeah sometimes yeah maybe maybe my facial we're just expression doesn't fit to what i am saying either you know <laughs> like <laughs> it's just uh maybe he's thinking about something else at the same moment but she seems very intrigued by that and blushes even more i don't know how much blush you can put on one little girl's face oh god i will cut that sentence out it sounds a bit weird <laughs> the the fact that i'm uh, i'm i'm apologizing for this uh, means i'm not cutting it out so yeah uh, i think i think what's also i honestly wanted to make a joke about that because like you said before maybe griffith is thinking about something completely else yeah, uh, and, I, and I, you know what I wanted to say. Why does the episode have to end like this? Yeah, you, you know what I wanted to say, especially with oh, no. with his f- sentence he said before. Uh, no, she said before. What a shock! My heart is still pounding. So the word pounding really came to mind when <laughs> thinking about how Griffith imagined yeah, when, yeah, he looked, yeah, okay, when he when okay, he looked okay. at shot. But there is a yeah, rather yeah, okay. harsh twist Connie, to this whole episode. Get yourself together. <laughs> so yeah, maybe coming away from all these fantasies that Griffith might have, or we might have. Uh, there is a why there is a harsh uh, happening or incident or accident or I don't know I'm of what out of words right now that is that is I don't know taking the final page of this episode uh, because as as the band of the hawk is arriving and shouting Griffith and Charlotte doesn't really say anything and Griffith says come let us return everyone is worried there is a stray arrow 
uh, unfortunately flying directly on Edge Griffith and it doesn't really seem to be that stray after all and he pierces in through Gilhir's armor and it seems like also his heart. Yeah, and it all also seems as if there's blood um, at this point. Yeah, you kind, know, like kind a, of. I, I, I honestly, we, we will, yeah. I honestly wanted to ask you the same. Like when I when I read f these pages at the at the first time, it it kind of looked like that uh, blood was coming out of uh, out of the armor around the arrow. Yeah, no, oh. it's probably the the liquid put on. You know, the poison. Yeah, it could be. Um, could be. Yeah. And I was also one interesting uh, thing. Like, look at the back tip of that arrow. I didn't know that in medieval times. You know, there were those little, how, how can I call it, uh, apparatus to uh, to hold the string of the bow. You know, so it uh, you won't lose it. It looks as if this is a, an arrow from a, like you know, a, a um, toy bow. <laughs> ah, yeah, I know maybe what you mean. they they were built like that. I don't know. Probably Miura did some research. It's completely unnecessary for this podcast to say, but I just wanted to mention it because I noticed it, uh, like that. This. Do you find better words to describe it? Like at the back of this, next to the feathers. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. But I think this, uh, I think it's normal for normal bows, but I never thought it would. It's also the same for crossbows, because yeah. like crossbows. I'm don't really sure, use yeah. arrows, but they rather use bolts, um, bolts, uh, yeah. uh, bolt, bolts, yeah, yeah, and not not really arrows. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> All <laughs> right, then. Fact, yeah. uh, like there's the screw, and like, yeah, I think. Sorry, go, go on, on, please. No, no. You, uh, no, you I know. On. <laughs> I I wanted to like. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you, even though this whole scenery is pretty shocking and like this is a big cliffhanger until next week, what do you uh, do? You still have a phrase of wisdom in mind, even though this might be the end for Griffith today. <laughs> it's so cool that you adapted your voice like I always do. <laughs> phrase of wisdom, or okay, as I yeah, said last I have week, one. the ways of wisdom. The ways of wisdom are. Unerring. Yeah, um, yeah, I have one. <clears throat> In ancient tongues, let's speak our piece of Archer Studios' grand release. Thou shalt not err, nor wander far, for Guts' tales a shining star. If wisdom's light doth gleameth bright, ye must witness its initial flight, for those who scoff or turn away in ignorance they shall decay. Yeah, so AI got its screen time again here, but uh, I just wanted to shout out Arch Studios again. Just uh, watch the episode you probably already have, but... Uh, you know, I already amazing. wanted to say uh, that you really cooked here, and it was peak fiction, <laughs> but sadly, oh, no. it wasn't you, so I have to I have to hold to that sentence me. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but, but I, still, it's, yeah. but still, like, let, let's say that ChatGPT cooked here. Yeah, yeah, I, I um, altered some things here and there to make the rhyme scheme fit better, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Although I did that old English seminar, uh, I wouldn't have been able to come up with something like Doth Cleameth Bright, <laughs> you must witness its initial flight. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I thought it was cool because we were talking about uh, old English so many times yeah. already. Yeah, Mentioning Arch Studio one last time is kind of the obligatory ob obligatory thing for this podcast today yeah for today we will be mentioning them <laughs> many more times many more okay times. so um yeah check them out don't miss the the episode and i i had fun today thanks corny for talking to me um yeah i think that's it till till the next till episode. next time yeah i'm also glad every time we'll talk about it nice bye bye